began last week in reference to regeneration. We're looking at uh, James 1, 18. And as I finished that last lesson on the matter of regeneration, I told you that when we talk about uh, uh, the gospel, talk about new birth, talk about renovate, uh, regeneration, talking about salvation, we're not talking about adding something. We're not talking about tacking something on to something else. Uh, and that was a main point I wanted to make last week. We're not talking about putting a ribbon on a saw. We're not talking about putting a new suit on an old man, you remember? We're talking about, when we talk about regeneration, we're talking about total transformation. We're talking about entering into a right relationship with God. And what that demands, it demands a total new person, and you have to go back and start all over again. You don't get to, you're not supposed to hang on to the vestiges of things that have gone on in the past. You're supposed to go and step into a new life. And scripture uh, affirms that, and it isn't really even a New Testament affirmation. Uh, it's part of a promise and an anticipation of the Old Testament. For example, and that's the first word on your outline, the Old Testament. Jeremiah, for example, says that the heart of man, he says, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Uh, that's from the 13th chapter. In 1323, he says, can the Ethiopian change his skin? Meaning that the Ethiopian was, Ethiopian was uh, dark skin. Can he willingly, so can he willingly or or by wishing, or uh, is there anything that the Ethiopian can do about his skin color? No. Uh, unless he's Michael Jackson. But then, and Jer Jer uh, Jeremiah continues in that same scripture citation. He, spoke, he speaks about, oh, I just changed the page. He, uh, he speaks about changing the, the spots of the leopard. Can a, a leopard change his spots? Of course, the answer again is obviously no. And then he closes with this. He says, then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. If the leper can't change his spots, if the Ethiopian can't change his skin, how can you who are accustomed to doing evil change and do good? You can't. Okay? The only way you can begin to do good is to come, to, uh, come into a relationship with the Lord. And that's what he's saying. You can't change your life. If you're going to change your life, you have to have a transformation. Uh, and that's from uh, 1323 in Jeremiah. So in, in, uh, further, later on in chapter 31, Jeremiah makes a wonderful promise. And it's a promise in regards to transformation. In Jeremiah 31, 31, it says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, so forth and so forth. And then he says in verse 33, I'll make a new covenant. I will put my law in their inward parts. It won't be written on stone. I'll put it in their inward parts. I'll write in their hearts and I will be their God, and they will be my people. In other words, God, what God is saying there is that He's going to, rather than uh, the institution of law, He's going to get inside of them and change them from the inside to the outside. Since they can't do it on, his, on their own, even though they want to, humanity really wants to be able to change themselves. Since they can't do it on their own, God is going to do it for them. But to do that, man has to change at his very core. The natural man, that is the unregenerate man, the man that doesn't know God, the sinful man, the unredeemed man, the unsaved man does not. It says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, uh, it says, they receive, receive the things of the Spirit of God. They cannot receive the things of the Spirit. That's why oftentimes when you speak to people that are lost, unless the Spirit has started to work on their hearts, they don't have any idea what you're talking about. You know, when my 
my brother used to speak uh, of the gospel to me when I was real young, I'd have a clue what he was talking about. It, none of it made sense. It was all gobbledygook. And, uh, but, uh, so, the, the reason why they, the reason why they can't receive anything is because they're dead. They're dead in their walk. And, uh, and how well does a corp respond to anything? You know, we were just at a funeral a couple of weeks ago. The corpse wasn't going to respond to anything. So, when man is dead, he has no ability to respond. So, so what does he need? Well, he needs a new life. Uh, we've spoken of Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. How that men are dead in their trespasses and sin. Remember? We spoke of that last week. Following that they follow the lust of the flesh, the lust of their mind, the desires of the flesh, and that they're they are subject to the leadership of Satan, who is the prince of the power of the air. So they are children, and remember it says in that scripture, it describes them as children of wrath. You know why they're children of wrath? Because they deserve God's wrath. That's, what's, that's why they're called children of wrath. But it says, even, even when we are dead in our sins, in that same chapter in verse 5, cry, uh, verse five it says, Christ has the ability to make us alive, and He can raise us up. And that's the idea of resurrection from the dead, of a new life, of a new birth. And in Romans 6, it says, when you put your faith in Christ... You die, and you walk in, and it uses this, this wonderful little phrase. It says you walk in newness of life. Newness of life. Now that's what every person has to have. If they're a child of God, they have newness of life. The old things have been put away. They have become a new man. And the old life has to be totally done away with, and a new life has to come. Ephesians 4.24, you have to put on the new man, okay? And listen to this, you have to put on the new man, which God is created, which God has created in righteousness and true holiness. You want to measure yourself? What's your righteousness level? What's your holiness level tonight? When you come to salvation, you put on a new man, a new person, you don't, you don't take the old person and put new clothes on. You don't cover up the old man. You become a new person. It's a, it's a re-creation. Right? And if you were looking for the most graphic, the best illustration of that in the, in the Word of God, where would you go? John 3, and you would look at the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, okay? And uh, John 3, let me see, it says, there was a man of the Pharisees. You know what that means? It doesn't say there was a man who was a Pharisee. It says there was a man of the Pharisees. And it's very, uh, it's very, uh, it's, it's very, it's written that way purposefully in the Greek because what it means is, is that Nicodemus was hot stuff. He was a very well-recognized Pharisee. He was, a, he would be considered a great religious leader. He would be a man would be held in high esteem by, by uh, uh, his followers, by the, the Jewish people. Uh, he may have been as prominent as any teacher in Israel. In verse, uh, look at what Jesus says in verse 10 as he speaks. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel? Okay. Are you the teacher of Israel? And the implication is, is that you are, if he's asking you, are you the teacher of Israel? The implication is that he is the teacher of Israel. He's trying to, he's, he's appealing to him upon the, the, the magnitude of who he is. So here's a man 
one man who is recognized perhaps publicly as the teacher in Israel, someone of great stature of the Pharisee sect. In other words, he's well versed in the law, okay? And he, he comes to Jesus and uh, he says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher, come from God, for no one else can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Okay? That's in verse 2 there. So, uh, here's this man of great esteem, a man, and he, this is a man who recognizes his own calling, but he recognizes now one, it would seem that he's speaking to one that he recognizes as being significantly above himself in his understanding. This is a very high-ranking Pharisee, and he comes to Jesus, and he's going to start asking Jesus questions because he doesn't know the answers. Okay? That's significant. Most Pharisees wouldn't ask anybody any religious question. Okay? They, they would not want everybody to think they knew everything. So he comes, and we, he says, We know you're a teacher from God. No one can do the miracles that you do except God be with him. And he... And he never, uh, notice something now, okay, but he never says what's on his heart. Does he ask a question? But what does verse 3 say? That's the answer. Huh? That's the answer. What does Jesus do? It says, Jesus answered. He never asked Jesus a question. But it says, Jesus answered, okay? So, Jesus, uh, uh, you know, he, he's told them, you're a teacher. He says, you come from God. And, and, and it's interesting to note that he doesn't ask a question, but Jesus answers the question that's really inside of Nicodemus. This is why Nicodemus came. This is what Jesus knows because of who Jesus is. And what does he tell him? He says, most assuredly, some versions will say, truly, truly, I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus is answering the exact question that's on Nicodemus' heart, but Nicodemus hasn't spoken a word about a question. All he's done is recognize who Jesus is. You're a great teacher from God. So what is on Nicodemus' heart is how do I get to the kingdom? Those are probably hard words for him to say, if you think about it. If a Pharisee is ask, asking a, 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 what, in, what in essence is, a, you know, Jesus, uh, Jesus didn't go to a seminary. You know, he's, he's, in essence, he's seen as a rebel street teacher. But this Pharisee, who's highly recognized, he's the teacher of Israel has come to him to ask a question. Here's a man, a Pharisee, he, he's got, when you think about a Pharisee, they got it going on religiously. But, so, so, then let me ask you this. If he's asked, why is he asking the question? I'm sure. He doesn't think he's going to have access to the kingdom of heaven. If that's what's on his heart, if Christ knows what's on his heart, and why would he not know that he doesn't have access to the kingdom of heaven? Because there's nothing inside of him that confirms that he's a child of God. See, children of God have confirmation of who they are in God. It confirms itself within them and it displays itself in fruit. Because fruit is what attracts people. The fruit, the light, the salt. So here comes Nicodemus, he comes to Jesus, and the question of his heart is, what do I do to get into the kingdom? And the implication would be, he thinks of himself, he knows he's religious. He's an ex to be a Pharisee, he has to be an expert in the law. I try to live, if he's a Pharisee, if he's a good Pharisee, he lives by the code of the Old Testament. He's a very ethical man. He's a man you would say today who's very moral. He's trusted by his friends. 
He's well respected in his community. But he comes to Jesus and he says, what do I need to add to my life to get into the kingdom of God? And Jesus, in essence, tells them, you don't add anything. You can't add anything. That's not the way salvation works, folks. You've got to start all over again. Sorry, but it's true. You just have to kill the old thing and start with the new thing. You have to be born again. And Nicodemus says to him, uh, Nicodemus asks this question. He says, how can a man be born when he's old? Okay? Uh, and he's not, and do you think Nicodemus understands what Jesus is trying to tell him? Yes, he does. He's, he's, not, he's not asking a physical thing. He understands exactly. Give me a break. Nicodemus is a, a very smart man. He's not saying physically, physically, how can I go back and be born again? He's just picking up. Jesus tells him he has to be born again. Jesus is speaking parabolically. Remember that word? What's it mean? To speak in parables. parables. So he's, he's speaking to him in the same language he's using. It's a, the speech. They're used to speaking that way. Jesus often speaks in parables. So he picks up on the metaphor and he uses the same descriptive terms that Jesus uses. And he's saying, how does someone, really what he's saying is, okay, listen to me Christians. How does someone who has professed to know everything, how, how can someone who has professed to be saved all these years, how do they really get saved? That's what Nicodemus is asking. Because Nicodemus has thought for his entire life that he was a child of God. And you know what he's figured out? I ain't a child of God. So how does someone who's had all these many years of religion, who's followed this code, who's, who's done all these things for the Lord, how can somebody, how can a Pharisee, how can, how can a rabbi, a teacher of the law ever go back and undo all that they've done and start all over again? That's what he's saying. That's the question on Nicodemus' heart. You know, if you if you have any have any, any experience with all Orthodox Jews, you would understand that they and, and, and it's it's not a, a unique mindset. It's a mindset that has invaded the evangelical church of how can we go back and unravel all these years and start all over again. People think they have a big investment on what they've done. Christ doesn't care if you if you come to him on your deathbed. He's still going to accept you as a, as a child of God. And then, but like we said before, there's no second class citizens in heaven. Everybody's the same in essence. So uh, that, was, that was what was on Nicodemus' mind in here. Can he enter the, uh, into his mother's womb a second time and be born as they, as they make this parabolic uh, discussion back and forth? And he's saying that, uh, and, and this is... Uh, so they're asking, what, what we're talking about is, is how can I be born again spiritually? He understands. Uh, uh, Nicodemus knows that Jesus is speaking of, of how to be born again spirit, spiritually. And Nicodemus is asking, how can I do that? How can it happen? And Jesus says to him, you can't do it. You've been doing it for all these many years. You can't do it. Nicodemus, you can't do it. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot what? He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He tells him, you can't do it. You have to be born of what? The water and the Spirit. It has to be done by water and Spirit. It has to be done by a power and a resource that you don't have. You don't have access to the water. You don't have access to the power that will allow you access to the kingdom of God. You need the power that is the water and the spirit. So what does that refer to? Okay. Well, that's the water of salvation. Uh, if you go back to Ezekiel 36, you'll see in Ezekiel 36, and remember, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, okay? So he uses a reference that Nicodemus will be totally 
from me, O oh wind. He, 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 he places before him something that is very familiar to him. And Jesus is speaking to, to Nicodemus in terms he understands. And because Nicodemus is an Old Testament expert, and Nicodemus is aware of the promise of Ezekiel 36.25, which says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you. Who's I? God. I will sprinkle clean water upon you. And then, so, uh, since God's going to do it, who else is going to do it? Nobody. God is sovereign. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you will be clean from your filthiness and for your, from your idols, and I will cleanse you. And God's the only one that can do that. You have to be cleansed by the water of salvation. It's not the water of baptism. It's the water of salvation. What he's saying to Nicodemus is this. The number one thing you have to, to has to happen to, to you to be born again is you have to have a sovereign cleansing. See, you've got when you're when you're lost, you've got a sinful being. You have to be cleansed from that sinfulness. So you have to be cleansed by a sovereign act by, of God. And secondly, that so sovereign act happens how? The water comes through the Spirit. That's how it is. That how that's how it is implemented in your life. That's how salvation happens. You need a sovereign salvation that comes from outside of you. It's just like Ezekiel prophesied. Clean water cleanses your, cleanses your filthiness. When Paul wrote to Titus, he talks about the washing of water through the Word, the water of regeneration. And in verse 26 there in Ezekiel, Okay, Ezekiel 36, 26, it says, listen to what it says, A new heart will I give you. I'm going to wash you with water in the Spirit, and then it says, A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. And then it says, I'll put my spirit within you, and cause you from the inside out to walk in my statutes. You know, see, the problem with the law is nobody could keep it, correct? But when you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, you have a much greater capability of keeping the law. And then he says, you shall keep my ordinances, and you shall do them. So when Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born of the water and the Spirit to enter into the kingdom, He's taking Nicodemus right back to Ezekiel 36 that Nicodemus knows very well. And he's saying, you know what the prophet said. You need to be sovereignly cleansed by God. It comes from God outside of yourself and the planting of His Holy Spirit in your heart. And it gives you a new life and a new heart and a new motivation, actually. A new motivation to be who God wants you to be. See, we have a perverted... If we aren't ever... Uh, actually saved, we have a perverted perception of what it means to be a child of God because we try to do it within ourselves without allowing Him to do it through us. So why is this necessary? Well, if you go back to verse 6 in John 3, uh, if you try to do it on your own, what, what does it say? That which is born of the flesh is what? Flesh. All you do when you are not born again and you try to reborn yourself is you produce more of you. You don't, you don't, there is no cleansing involved. All it is is you reproduce what you already are. And that's why so many Christians butt their heads against walls because they're not really Christians because they haven't been born again yet. They fight the same thing over and over and over. So don't be surprised, Jesus is telling Nicodemus, don't be surprised that I tell you you have to be born again. If you want to be different, what do you have to be? You have to be born again. And then he says, he, this, this, some people give this a real mysterious uh, commentary. He says the wind blows where it wants and you hear the sound and you can't tell from where it comes and where it goes and so everyone, and so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. That just simply means that the Holy Spirit is like the wind. 
you don't know where he's at or how he's working, and he comes when he wants. There's nothing, nothing mysterious about it. He's selling, he's just saying, I can't tell you how or when the Holy Spirit does this, but it's a sovereign act of God utilizing his Holy Spirit. You can't put it on a chart. You can't check a box and make it happen. You can't even see it coming. You can't see it going. It gives birth. It gives a new birth to whom God sovereignly wills to have a new birth. The Spirit of God moves into a heart, and he, he, he then rebirths within that person a new spirit, the spirit of, of himself, through the washing of the water of the Word in regeneration. It cleanses the heart. It plants within man a spirit. And what, what he's telling Nicodemus is that you need a new life. And you need a new life by a sovereign act of God. That's what Jeremiah 24, 7 speaks to, where God says, I will give a new heart. I will give them a new heart, he says, to know me. So you can't know God unless you have a new heart. You can try to do it on your own, but you can't know him. According to his word in Jeremiah 24, 7, I will give them a heart to know me, a new nature, a new heart, a new life. It's like it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Okay? Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So what I'm saying here is that a new birth, is the, that's the whole deal. You have to have a new birth. That's what salvation, the word in your outline is salvation is. It is God sovereignly... And you can call that, you don't have to call it salvation, you can call it regeneration, you can call it new birth. But it means that God sovereignly comes down to a sinner, and by His grace, He cleanses that sinner, and He plants His spirit in, in that sinner, so that the cleansing of that sinner takes care of His relationship to God, and the planting of the spirit takes care of His power in the, in, to live in the will of God. Is that sentence in your outline? It is, it is God sovereignly coming down to a sinner and by His grace cleansing that sinner and planting His Spirit in that sinner so that this cleansing of that sinner takes care of His relationship, the sinner's relationship to God and the planting of the Spirit takes care of His power to live in the will of God. Does that make sense? And, that, and that's the purpose of regeneration. That's why I believe, see, I believe in salvation experiences. You know why? Because when the Creator of the universe, when His Holy Spirit comes down and touches your heart, I don't think there's any way, any way that you cannot recognize that having happened. You know, I ask people about salvation a lot. You tell me about your salvation. Well, I was 23. If I ask you questions like that more than once, as we get to know each other, there's a reason why. I want to hear about your experience. I want to know how old you were. I want to know, I want to hear about God touching your heart. You know what? It encourages you. It helps me understand God a little bit better. Because God touches hearts in different ways. Now maybe you didn't, maybe you were saved without any experience. It's not, it's not very, it's not indicated that way in the Bible, I'll tell you that. People that came to knowledge of Jesus Christ had experiences. So that's just a, uh, I'm not sure who would teach you that theologically. That's just the materialism. So you can take it for what it's worth. But I want to listen, I want us to go back to our source scripture, which is in James 1.18. And that's that's where this study is supposed to be taking place. And I want us to uh, jump. I'm gonna I'm gonna we're gonna answer four questions in James 1.18. So what, really what I finished is the introduction to the study it took me a week and a half. But, and uh, so we need to get back to James. And I want to
talk, ask you four questions about regeneration. And they're actually very simple questions and not that hard. And it won't, it won't take us too long to answer them. Of course, I'll, I'll, I'll expand them and I'll talk about them for a long time. But the first question is, what is regeneration? And what we just said that is that man. Man can't know God without holiness, correct? And we know that man naturally is not holy. Okay? Man doesn't recognize his unholiness. In fact, the Word tells us that man does not recognize his own unholiness. In fact, he considers himself oftentimes to be holy. And when he doesn't consider himself to be holy, then he usually blames God for his lack of holiness. So, how are you going to get out of that dilemma? Well, uh, if you're, especially if you're blaming God and not recognize it, how are you going to change? You know, if you keep doing the same thing over and over, you're not going to get different results. You have to change. You have to say, well, you know. Now, some people will say, well, I'll live my life to a higher standard. I'll live with better ethics. Uh, I'll, I'll be a better law. A law. Uh, I'll, I'll meet more requirements of the law. I'll be a harder worker. Those, you know what every one of those things are? They're all flesh. And what does flesh produce? What did we read ten minutes ago? Flesh produces flesh. So all you get when you do that is you get more flesh. It's self-replicating. So what has to happen is, is that man needs a divine intervention of a sovereign God who is by his spirit. His spirit comes in and washes him, lives with him, and plants a new life in him gives him his spirit to energize his new life and unto obedience. That's why I believe in the Lordship, unto obedience. And that's a sovereign act, and that's what regeneration is, okay? Okay. But when we get into our verse and we look at the uh, question number one, what is it? What's the nature of regeneration? I've already alluded to that. In fact, we've already covered a great portion uh, of it says in 118, of this, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. By his own will, he brought us forth by the will of truth. And that's, that's the very nature of regeneration, okay? It is God who brings forth regeneration, and he gives birth to us as, in your outline, the two words are new beings. In regeneration, you're not the same. You're a whole new creation. It's the same verb. Look at the 15th verse in James 1. It's exactly the same verb that's used back in James 1.15 when it says, then when desire has conceived, that's the exact same word that's used over here uh, when it's when it says brought forth. Okay? Brought us forth is the same verb. So God conceives in us of his own will the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation. Okay? Remember what the first fruits are. What are the first fruits? The first fruits are the best fruits. The first fruits are the first fruits of the harvest. The first fruits in this instance in me and you. We are the first fruits of his new creation. Christians are the first fruits of the new world, of the new universe, of the new, of the new everything. Okay? So that's what he means when he speaks of first fruit. God, when he conceives, brings forth within us a regenera regeneration. He brings forth a new life. It's, it's written in the, the Aorist tense, which means... It doesn't have a past, present, or future. God brings forth in you a new life and it has no past, present, or future. It's as if it has always existed. And it will always exist. And it is existing right now. So, it's pretty cool. So, it looks back to the event of salvation when we're born by... We are born, really, we become... We are born of a divine parent. And we're given new lives as children of God. Now, if you want a technical definition for He brought us in 118, uh, where it says He brought us forth, He brought us, here's one 
that I think is excellent. And I don't know who wrote it. I know it's in my notes, but I don't know who wrote it. But what this person said is that regeneration is that act of God by which the principle of new life is implanted in man and the governing disposition of his soul is made holy. The governing disposition of his soul is made holy. That's a great definition. Regeneration is that act of God by which the principles of new life are implanted in man and the governing disposition of his soul is made holy. That's total transformation. That's what Romans 3 uh, speaks of, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, 3. In fact, in Peter's writing, Peter talks about us becoming partakers of a divine nature. That's the way you become a partaker of a divine nature is God gives you His life. God gives you Himself. He gives you His righteous character. He, and He imparts and implants His holiness in us uh, so that we can function as He desires us to function. So as a Christian then, you and I possess, according to the Word of God, the very nature of God is the word in your outline. If you look at 2 Peter 1.4, that's where you see that. We are partakers of the divine nature. Now in its fullness, we are, uh, you, you know, we are not, we have not yet partake, partaken of all that that implies, but we are partakers of it now, even now. That new life principle, if we're a child of God, has been planted in us. And it's, it's a, it, it is completed. Listen, in this, you know, I always talk about salvation being a verb, okay? But in this instance, salvation happens, okay? It's an experience. It happens, and when it happens, God plants His seed inside of you. It's a moment of time, okay? And then you start the process of self, sanctif uh, salvation, which we call sanctification. It's an event, it's an act by which God creates in you a new you. It's a secret work. You can't perceive it. You know, we don't have little things on our heads that say Christian and non-Christian. That's why, you know, that's why Jesus said we can't tell the wheat from the tares. But listen, weeds always end up looking like weeds. And that's fruit. What's your fruit? You know, weeds look like weeds. You know, and it's, it's, it, it is only the, only, the only way you can figure out is you can, you have to, you have to judge the effect that the transformation has had on a person's heart, and if it's real and if it's true, they will be there will be evidence in their life of being recreated. Because recreation is a divine miracle. There has to be evidence because that's how God calls other new believers because of who you are and how you are. That's where that's where the little door opens in the heart and the Holy Spirit starts saying, "I'm outside. Let me in. I need to talk to you." So. It overcomes that this regeneration overcomes the deadness of sin, the deadliness of sin, and, and makes you no longer subject to the power of sin, Paul says in Romans 6. And it no longer has dominion over us. And we, 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 we don't follow the old master, we follow a new master, and we follow him willingly, and we follow him eagerly. Okay? Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I have come that they might have what? Life. What do dead men need the most? They need, what do dead men need the most? They need life. And so Jesus comes that we might have life. So what is regeneration? What is it? Uh, it's where we get a new life. Total transformation of the inner person. Okay?